they've rebranded it for sort of blue state audiences. And they're saying, yeah, we, we need vast new powers to prevent January 6th from happening again. And we want you to, to cooperate with the authorities and building this gigantic new machinery that will keep everybody safe. But, you know, we know how this ends. I mean, it, it, it's, it's going to end in, in, a, in a domestic surveillance state that um, is just inescapable. appreciate you being back on. I think it's been about a year and a half since we last spoke. Um, so it's great to have you back on. I have a lot of questions that I'd like to ask you today about the Biden-Putin summit, about the media. But the first question I have for you is uh, very important. What is your favorite Pink Floyd album? <laughs> uh, probably Animals, I would think. Um, I don't know. There. Uh, I actually like the uh, the the last one. Um, yeah, I did too. Actually, the final the final cut. I'm one of the few people that 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 listen to that album a lot. Uh, but I wasn't a huge Pink Floyd fan, but I but I I do like I do like them. And uh, I recently got a chance to interview Roger Waters for the first time, which was cool. So yeah, I saw that. That was amazing. It was uh, great to hear his opinions. He's one of those uh, he's one of those celebrities that seems to really have a good understanding of geopolitics so it was a great interview that you did with him. yeah he's uh he pays a lot of attention and he's very he's very outspoken and, and you know he, he's kind of rock and roll still which is which is cool <laughs> uh you know rock and roll should be a little angry so uh well i, I do have a recommendation have you ever listened to their early albums like metal or adam hart mother or obscured by clouds I, I haven't, you know, I'm a, I was never much of a music person until recently because I started playing the drums. So um, oh. I'd be I'd be happy to to check out anything that you recommend. You, you should check those out. Um, they don't they're the albums that don't really get any radio play, but that was right after Sid Barrett and they did some really experimental stuff. It's it's pretty great. Um, yeah, I, I'd start out I guess with Adam Hart Mother. It's a pretty awesome album. Uh, okay. What, what, what kind All of right. music are you into, by the way? Um, so I, you know, I grew up listening to really everything, um, played a lot of basketball, listened to a lot of hip hop growing up, uh, you know, I'm into everything, you know, rock, punk, um, you know, now, now that I'm playing the drums, it's, <laughs> I'm, I'm basically just picking out songs that have cool drum riffs, so, uh, that's, cool. that's my thing, and, and I also have kids, so I end up listening to a lot of kid music, which is not great, but... <laughs> Cool. Well, uh, yeah. So again, I wanted to uh, ask you about the uh, Biden-Putin summit, the uh, treason summit, 2021. Um, I know that that's really uh, been in the news a lot the past week, and it was pretty funny considering how it was covered so differently than the Trump-Putin summits in the past. And one thing that I noticed is, that, as far as the media coverage, is there was near uniform. Um, like questions for Putin, for example, that had to do with human rights, freedom of press. And I found it very ironic considering how Julian Assange is still in prison, how Edward Snowden is hiding in Russia for to, to remain free. And um, there really seemed to be a, a, a severe cognitive dissonance there. And the Western media was extremely propagandistic in, in my view. So just wondering generally what your thoughts were on the summit and the media coverage of the summit. So first of all, for your followers that don't know, I I lived in Russia for 10 years. Um, I was there. I was a reporter there when Putin came to power. And so there's a huge irony for me in watching this this <laughs> this performance, because when Putin first came up, uh, you know, I, I was um, pretty tight with a lot of Russian reporters, uh, including people who work for uh, papers like Novaya Gazeta. Uh, who had a number of people who were either beaten or killed during that period. Um, and we all knew right away what Putin was. Um, one of my best friends actually ha had run into Putin uh, long before he came to power, when he was in St. Petersburg, when he was deputy mayor. 
Uh, we knew about his KGB past. We knew he, he had a very, very nasty um, uh, approach to journalists, didn't, didn't really have a, think a whole lot about journalistic freedoms. And we were reporting that stuff pretty early, but the American expat press at the time uh, in, in Moscow, the official posture towards Putin was that this was somebody we were, you know, a man with whom we could do business. And if you go back and look at the coverage of him initially, you'll find all these profiles that maybe they weren't fawning exactly, but they were certainly very, very indulgent. Like there's, there was a famous piece by the, um, by the New York Times Magazine uh, by a guy named John Lloyd that, <laughs> that very, very uh, humorously uh, addressed Putin's KGB passed by essentially explaining that in the 70s, the KGB was where sort of up, upwardly mobile yuppies uh, in in Soviet society, that that, that was a, a good career path for them. Um, it wasn't something you should draw any conclusions from because he was simply an educated person from St. Petersburg, and that's what those people did at the time. So there's been this incredible turnaround in the approach to Putin since he first came to power, even though he's exactly the same person that he's always been. He, he was he was immediately when he came to power, um, you know, sort of autocratic and and he cracked down on uh, the press, especially uh, they were friends of mine uh, who were um, who went through some pretty rough consequences. I was also, um, you know, colleagues with people like Anna Politkovska, who were eventually murdered. Um, and uh, and so now, you know, now that Putin is a sort of bet noir of the international scene, and you know, he's somehow been turned into this symbol of all things that are a threat to uh, kind of you know the neoliberal way of life. Um, you know, you, you you see this this type of journalism. It's not it's not journalism. It, what what it is? It's it's a it's a performance where. What each of these reporters are trying to do when they get up in camera is they're just they're just trying to get a clip of themselves, you know, posturing in front of this sort of symbol of anti-Americanism or whatever it is. Now, Putin's not a good guy. Like, I, I would never say that. Um, but the, the hypocrisy uh, is pretty striking, it's, you know, in particular, when we think about our relationship to Russia, uh, you know, there, there were questions you know, where they were asking Biden and Biden was talking about how, well, you know, wouldn't it be incredible if people around the world thought of America as a country that interfered in elections? <laughs> and and uh, this is after, you know, I was there in 1996 when we openly, blatantly interfered in the Russian election. Like we had consultants living, you know, with offices in the Kremlin. Um, we spent millions of dollars helping Yeltsin win re-election uh, openly, you know, and so it's it's ridiculous. Um, you know, I, I think it's more comical than anything else. And it's, uh, you know, it's kind of sad that there are people who actually don't see through it. So as far as the meeting itself, do you think that Biden meeting with Putin, at least you know, from what we know of the conversation, will achieve anything positive? I, I think... Um, I think the history of the Democratic Party, uh, in terms of its uh, attitude towards uh, Russian relations, when it's in power, right, or when it has been in power in the last 20, 25 years, is that they want they want to have at least a rapprochement with Russia. They want to, they want to be able to cooperate with Russia, with Russia about things like national security, um, you know energy policy, although there, there are some disputes there. Uh, we've seen over and over again that there are, there are these overtures that are made uh, to Russia, no matter who's in power there, whether it's Yeltsin or Putin. Uh, we saw uh, Obama with his uh, ill-fated sort of reset uh, effort. Remember when they, they presented the yeah. the, uh, the Perezagruska button, which was a mistranslation. Today, uh in anticipation of uh, this important meeting and our our time here together, I wanted to uh, present you with uh, a little gift, which represents what President Obama and Vice President Biden and I have been saying, and that is 
we want to reset our relationship. And let's, do it, let's do it together. So we will do it together, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. You are Thank very you. welcome. We worked hard to get the right Russian word. Do you think you, we got it? You get it wrong. I got it wrong. <laughs> it should be перезагрузка. Ah. And this says перегрузка, uh, which means overcharged. <laughs> <laughs> well, we won't let you do that to us. I, I promise. <laughs> OK. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much. Very kind of you. <laughs> Would be on my desk. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, uh, we mean it, and we look forward to it. I think Putin's role uh, as as this uh, figure of horror that he occupied for the kind of government in exile during the, the Trump years, for people like Adam Schiff, you know, who are constantly shaking their fist at Putin. In real terms, I don't I don't think the the Biden administration really wants that. I don't I don't think they really want hardcore confrontation with Russia because it's just not in their interest. Now there is a genuine difference of opinion within the government about how to deal with Russia, because there's a faction, for instance, on the Syria issue that is very, very strongly opposed to what Russia is doing in Syria, uh, while there's another faction that believes that working with, um, essentially working with the Russians uh, might be the smarter play there. But that faction has lost out uh, in the Democratic Party in the last five or six years. So. Uh, you know, there, it's not like there aren't issues, but I don't think they I don't think they want world war. Although, you know, again, they're being very irresponsible about it. This buildup in Ukraine, um, you know, the, they, they just don't know how to behave in a way that's rational when it comes to dealing with um, other major powers in the world. And, and this is just another example of that. Another reason that I know that the media is full of shit is because of the way that they cover Alexei Navalny and the fact that he is very nationalistic, very xenophobic, and essentially a Russian version of Donald Trump, but he's uh, sort of treated as this hero who's standing up against Putin and this uh, this brave figure in Russia. So just wondering what you think of that and just the whole Alexei Navalny uh story or person overall so i've been i've been kind of hesitant to comment about navalny because of my my experience when i was there um i know that the western press has a habit of latching onto figures that they imagine um will be popular uh and would represent you know sort of the populist opposition to um you know to figures that they dislike uh, or, or represent sort of the Western uh, way. Uh, and the Western press always overshoots um, their estimation of those the, the popularity of such figures. When I was there, there was a guy named Grigory Yavlinsky who was, um, who was the founder of this party called Yablica. Uh, and he was, you know, in a way you, you could describe him as kind of a, a Western style liberal. Uh, and they, they always overhyped Yavlinsky as a serious uh, contender uh, for power in Russia, whereas the ordinary person in Russia was much more likely um, to be interested in either an outright communist like, you know, Grigor Zuganov or a nationalist uh, like Alexander Lebed. Navalny, I think, you know, is, is interesting because he's... He's uh, he studied in the West. He's allegedly a Bernie Sanders supporter. You know, he's pals with the with Pussy Riot and all those folks. Um, and there are people I know who, who, who vouch for him. On the other hand, he had, he does has, have this other streak in him, and I'm I'm hesitant to kind of just dismiss it because Russians look at the, a lot of those issues just differently than Americans do. Like. You know, we would call it xenophobic. We would call it racist. You know, they they have attitudes towards, um, you know, for instance, the war in Chechnya that are difficult probably for Americans to understand. Um, these are longstanding, ancient, you know, in some cases, ancient conflicts. Uh, I don't 
approve of them, you know, approve of, the, of those attitudes. Uh, but they look different to Russians than they look to us. So, but but certainly Navalny's been misrepresented as as this uh, beacon of Western rectitude because he's not that. He's a, I think he's a mix of of different things of um, you know a kind of Russian style uh, populism, nationalist populism. Um, also, he's he's probably not nearly as popular as he's been made out to be. There are other figures in Russia who who probably garner more support. That doesn't mean Putin isn't unpopular as we've seen from the from the protests, but that that doesn't mean that those protests are unilaterally in favor of Navalny. So why do you think it is that the US government and US media seem so favorable towards Navalny in particular? Well, because again, it's all performative. He's he's an image of what they imagine everybody in the world wants, which is a pro-Western, you know, sort of English-speaking uh, leader who um, who would represent their values. And this is their playbook in basically every country, right? They 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 want to steer uh, the press, both the press and the local population, to the extent that they can, away from anybody who might you know, reasonably be construed as a, as a nationalist or somebody who, um, you know, is looking out for the interests of their own country ahead of, uh, you know, the West's interests. Uh, and they want, again, they want that person, you know, with whom we can do business, you know, our man in Havana, you know, or, you know, the, the um, you know, they're, they're always looking out for, for, for that kind of person who who is a symbol of our idea of a leader and you know when I when, when I was there um, we heavily propagandized Boris Yeltsin as a, as a Democrat when he was anything but that I mean he was blowing up journalists with exploding briefcases you know as early as 1994 uh, and we were selling him as this great Democrat um, and that's just what we do you know around the world we we, we, we back a horse uh, and, you know, often to the detriment of, um, of the local population. Uh, and, you know, th th this, is, this was actually a theme, not to go on about this too long, but this was a theme of the Af Afghanistan papers uh, that the Washington Post published. They, they just talked about this pattern of how we'll, we'll get it into our heads that X, Y, or Z, local political figure is the person who has to, has to be backed, will shower that person with support, either money or weapons or whatever. Um, that person will end up being repressive or corrupt. In turn, will stimulate an oppositional response, which forces us to, to commit even more resources to putting down the opposition. And this is a pattern we get into all over the world. We, we just, we back the wrong horse. Uh, we put all our eggs in one basket. Um, and we end up on the wrong side of an oppositional movement that, you know, that ends up being a bigger problem than it would have been if we had just left things alone. And frankly, Putin, you know, is kind of an, uh, an outcrop of that um, dynamic. And I would even say that Donald Trump is kind of an outcrop of that dynamic because the, uh, essentially he's, he's the kind of oppositional leader to, uh, that we've encountered a lot uh, abroad. Moving away from Russia for a minute, I did have a question in regards to recent media coverage of uh, Israel-Palestine, um, because I recently had Richard Medhurst on, he's an independent journalist, and we both noticed that in the recent coverage last month of what was happening in Gaza, it seemed as though the Western media was a little less blatantly anti-Palestinian as they have been in the past. I'm just wondering if you've noticed that too, and if you have any theories as to why that is. I, th I think Occam's razor applies there, and the, the most obvious explanation is, is is that, you know, people have honestly come to a change of opinion uh, about what's going on in Israel. It's taken quite a long time. Um, a lot of members of the press uh, come from, you know, they're, they're highly educated, they, they tend to be upper class, they've gone to... Um, you know, the, the leading universities and educational institutions in the country. And for a very long time, um, they were steered away from 
you know, making any negative judgments about Israel. I mean, as, as you know, it's, you know, there, there are in some states, it's actually either against the law or sort of unofficially barred to even advocate, um, you know, in, in against Israel in certain ways. Um, but, you know, I think over time, there, there's been enough information about uh, the brutality and the excesses um, in Gaza that it's just seeped into the consciousness of even even the media, um, and we've and we've seen to a degree some of it, it come into Congress as well. Although, as you may have noticed, um, the leading figures in the Democratic Party uh, sort of remained in the same place, um, but there's some movement there too. I think we even saw among celebrities uh, they had an initial response to tweet out some sympathy for the people of Gaza and then deleted those tweets and apologized for, for putting right. them out there. So I think there's still a very uh, strong kind of push for censorship on the issue. Um, but I, I don't know, I think, I don't know if maybe it was the bombing of the Al Jazeera building in particular. I don't know if maybe that kind of influenced some sentiment, but again, it, it just didn't seem as blatantly one-sided as it had been before. Yeah, I mean, look, this is a, it's a, it's an extremely difficult issue for for the American news media because um, from a policy level, the United States is just all in on Israel. Israel is the centerpiece of our entire foreign policy strategy in the region. For all intents and purposes, Israel might as well be an outpost of the United States in the Middle East. Uh, we give an enormous sum of money uh, to Israel. Um, during the bombing, in fact. During the bombing, we provide them with weapons. Yeah, I mean, look, it, it, it's it's closer to being, you know, a, an American state than you know, probably some of our own territories are. Uh, and it's our only real um, outpost in the region. And so the idea that we would withdraw support from Israel um, is probably not realistic. Uh, in the, in the long run, um, but you know, I think what people have been waiting for is for the United States to exercise its influence to to um, uh, sort of impact Israel's behavior uh, and its treatment of, of Palestinians, and we just haven't done that really uh, yet. Um, but it makes it difficult for people who are covering foreign policy because they're getting one message probably constantly from all their supports, all their sources in the national security world. Um, and they're hearing something else from, uh, you know, academia, from pop culture and, and so on. So they're, they're probably torn. Um, well, I did want to shift now from corporate media to more questions about independent media. And I, I guess a good way to make that transition is uh, you recently left Rolling Stone and I know you've been focusing more on uh, getting your work out through Substack and uh, your um, your podcast with Katie Halper, Useful Idiots, which is a, is a great show. Um, I believe that actually you guys kind of took that show from Rolling Stone, but I don't know if maybe you can just explain, uh, you know, what that transition was there and how it's kind of different now working on your own than working for a large corporation. Yeah, so I I, I left basically in two stages uh, last year around this time. Um, I, I was actually one of the first people to jump to Substack and uh, differently from people like Glenn Greenwald or Matt Iglesias or Andrew Sullivan, um, I didn't go because I was having a personality disagreement or, or an intellectual disagreement with my editors. Um, I had had some experience with Substack. I serialized a couple of books there, uh, including a book called Hate Inc. And um, I had a, you know, a small subscriber base, but it was, uh, I'd, li I'd like, the way it worked, I liked the, the, dy the uh, dynamic of working there, and I had kind of an inkling um, in an entrepreneurial way, I guess you could say, that there was, um, that it would be a smart move to jump from Rolling Stone to um, to the subscriber model. Um, so I, I, I stopped being essentially a staff writer for Rolling Stone last year and moved full time to writing for uh, for Substack at this site, TK. And uh, and then sort of eventually down the road, um, the 
podcast that I was doing with Kitty Halper that you mentioned, Useful Idiots, which was a Rolling Stone uh, supported podcast. Uh, we just sort of had a mutual parting of the ways there. Uh, I think probably one of the dynamics that was involved with us leaving was that, um, you know, since I was no longer on staff there, uh, you know, that, that created some tension between, um, between the, you know, the, the editors of Rolling Stone and, uh, us at the podcast. Um, so it, it ended up being not a comfortable fit. So we moved the podcast, uh, uh, off Rolling Stone, went independent and, um, you know, so similar to, you know, what Crystal Ball and Sagar and Jitty are doing, you know, we're, we're trying to make it work, um, independently. So those first episodes of Useful Idiots that you did with Rolling Stone, who owns those? Does Rolling Stone still own those episodes? Yeah, I think, I think so. Yeah, um, yes, probably technically they own it, um, or we or we jointly own it. I'm I'm not actually sure. Uh, we don't have that content. On, I don't think on our YouTube YouTube channel. Um, I'd have to I'd have to look. You know. I, that area of the business is not is not something I pay a lot of attention to, but um, but yeah, do you, no, uh, we, they, they they sponsored the original the original podcast. Do you feel unencumbered working on your own, where you have a little more freedom and leeway to do things that you may have thought twice about at Rolling Stone, or was it that just never even an issue at Rolling Stone? No, I do feel unencumbered, and again, even though I didn't have a personality or disagreement with with um my editors i always got along great with them they always gave me plenty of freedom um as I, i'm sure you're aware there's kind of a movement going on in in uh the commercial press where uh you know the newsrooms are having more of a say in uh how things go uh at certain publications if you um are not 100% in tune with the rest of your newsroom. Uh, Content-wise, you will eventually run into a problem, we, as we saw at the New York Times, uh, whether it was people like Donald McNeil or you know Seventeen Magazine or Bon Appetit or The Intercept or any of, or The Nation um, or any of a dozen other publications. Uh, you know, it's no longer understood in the business. When I was coming up, it was considered a virtue for a reporter to be kind of a lone wolf and, um, you know, a free thinker and not necessarily a team player like that would, among other things, because that tended to be the personality profile of a person who was a good uh, investigative reporter. Now that's not what is desired. Um, it's expected that people will kind of all fall in line uh, ideologically. And so when people don't, uh, we're seeing that problems are breaking out all over the place. I think an example that's pertinent to my experience was, you know, with uh, Aaron Mate writing for The Nation. You know, he he sort of crossed the orthodoxy in terms of um, what he was saying about Russiagate, and you know that prompted a response within the newsroom and a, essentially a, a, a staff-led revolt. Um, you know, that went all the way up to the publisher there, and. I, I that didn't happen with me, but um, I was at odds with the rest with the rest of the staff uh, on that issue and on some others. Um, so it wasn't hugely comfortable for me there uh, during the Trump years, and um, and now I'm on my own, and, and I think uh, I think it's it's been a lot easier, and it's certainly been um, a good good business move as well. You mentioned Aaron Mate. I did want to ask this because it's been such, you know, a big Twitter feud over the last couple of weeks. Have you been following I have. Of, uh, the feud it's between ridiculous. him and, and Jimmy Dore and the Young Turks? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it kind of reminds me of the life of Brian, you know, with the Judean people's front and the people's front of Judea. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I just kind of wanted you, I guess, to, to weigh in a little bit, honestly. Um, a lot of folks out there have kind of thought that the uh, $20 million that Young Turks received back in 2017 has changed their worldview a lot. It kind of in the context of this feud, a lot of old uh, tweets and clips have emerged of Cenk Uygur um, being suspicious of the gas attacks and even defending Jimmy Dore when Jimmy Dore 
was attacked by CNN for being skeptical. What they're referring to about the Syrian chemical attacks, Rand Paul went on television, said almost the same exact thing Jimmy did, which is don't just trust the Pentagon, let's verify to see if that attack was actually came from the sources that the Pentagon says that it came from. That's what any responsible citizen should do. By the way, that's what a journalist should do. But CNN, on the other hand, goes, the Pentagon said it, so it must be true. I took down the note from the spokesman from the Pentagon. That's why CNN needs to partner with people like PolitiFact to check facts for them, because they're not real journalists. If you were a real journalist, you would actually have your own organization to check facts, and you would have checked the fact about Jimmy Dore, which you didn't. Instead, you did false equivalency. It's another reason why this article is absolutely trash. And seemingly right around the time that he received that money, everything changed, and now Cenk is, you know, in a single tweet going after Aaron Maté, Jimmy Dore, Max Blumenthal, and Glenn Greenwald, you know, Jimmy Dore, along with these three award-winning journalists. So do you think that maybe money is a factor, or do you think it maybe just goes into this larger trend that we're seeing of progressive media kind of falling in line with, uh, with imperialist talking points? So uh, I, I was in a movie... Um, call about I.F. Stone called All Governments Lie, uh, and so was Jenk. And there's a, a an interesting, it's essentially about independent media and its role. And there's a scene in there where Jenk is talking about um, the early experiences of the Young Turks. They, they had, um, in 2008, they had gotten a lot of their audience uh, from young enthusiastic followers of Barack Obama. And when they transitioned to covering the Obama presidency, they were faced with kind of a financial conundrum, which was, well, if we start reporting negatively about Obama and about, for instance, his response to the 2008 crisis, we're going to lose audience. And this is the dilemma of anybody who is in independent journalism. The, if, you, if you follow your reporting, um, you will eventually uh, be put into a position where you might have to choose between making money and, and saying what you actually think. And that is a very difficult place to be. Now, at the time, I think he made the right choice and he did the reporting that I think was true about the Obama administration. They, they were critical of him, they, they took a hit audience wise, um, but it's tough to make that decision over and over and over and over again over a long period of time. And things can get complicated, particularly, um, you know, when you're taking, you know, abuse in a, in a Twitter beef or whatever it is. But, um, you know, I don't, I, don't, I don't know what's going on with the Young Turks. I, I, I disagree with them about a lot of things lately. Uh, I definitely disagreed with Cenk about the Russia story. Um, but um, is that something that you know that he ge genuinely believes, genuinely feels, or uh, you know, some, sometimes, sometimes because you're in a place uh, commercially and you you're reporting something um, that works for you financially, you do start to believe. You might start to believe it over time, especially when you're getting lots of praise and and feedback from your audience and that they're telling you that this is what they want. That kind of stuff can be really difficult to sort out. So I'm trying not to be judgmental about it. I, I disagree with them about a lot of things lately. Um, I, I think I think there was, a, there was a significant portion of the media during the Trump years that fell into this pattern of, you know, in, in opposition to Donald Trump, uh, anything is justified, you know, uh, and we have to go the extra mile to make sure um, that we're on the right side. Whereas, you know, for me, like a, tra a traditional journalist, I don't think in terms of sides. I think in terms of, uh, you know, what's what's true and what isn't. Uh, other people think in a different way. You know, again, I try not to judge about that stuff too much, though. Do you think that that dynamic has a potential to change. And I ask that because uh, TYT's viewership over you know, the last several months has been going down. And in this feud, they seemed to really be unable to, to get 
uh, most of the people on Twitter on, on their side, and um, the uh, like the live streams that TYT is doing lately is getting like only a few hundred people watching, whereas Jimmy Doors is getting ten thousand people. So, do you think that you know people honestly have maybe a distaste for that kind of propaganda and um, may be more prone to switch over to uh, independent, free-thinking type creators? Well, I, I don't think it's a place you want to be. Like, if you if you want to be the seen as the the representative of you know the the, the grown-up political establishment, which is the the tack that you know, say see people at CNN have taken. Well, they can take that. They're CNN, um, or MSNBC can take that. They're they're NBC. I mean, they 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 have a lot of institutional tools at their disposal to make sure that their audience stays at at, a, at least a certain level. But for independent media, it's very dangerous, um, even to be fallen in, in, in the place where you're perceived as being a defender of the establishment, right? So, I, you know, without speaking to whether that's actually what's going on here, um, if, you, if, you're, if you end up in a fight with somebody who's accusing you of being a sellout for the establishment, that, that's, a, that's not a particularly uh, winning proposition for somebody, for an organization like the Young Turks to be in. That's just my opinion. Um, but again, how difficult it is for them to avoid that, I, I, I have no idea, but um, you know, business-wise, that's a tough place to be, probably for them. And it seems as though the uh, the way that they try to fight against that, you know, whether it be establishment corporate media or in in this case specifically with the Young Turks, is to try to make people to the left of them seem as though they're on the right. So we had Jenk saying that repeatedly about Jimmy Dore's secretly a conservative, and uh, also you know trying to associate Glenn Greenwald and Max Blumenthal and Aaron Maté. With uh, with Bashar al-Assad and Vladimir Putin, uh, which again was is something that the corporate media will do to anybody on the left, even to Bernie Sanders, suggesting that he's associated with uh, with Vladimir Putin. So um, I don't know. Just yeah, what do you think about speak. that that yeah. line of attack at all? Because that just seems like a severe double think, where anybody to the left of me is actually on the right. Well, so I get that all the time, and it drives me crazy. Um, it's it's dishonest. Uh, it's this, it's, you know, it's McCarthyism, frankly. I mean, it, without being too dr dramatic about it, this has been what's going, what's happened um, within kind of the blue state media uh, for the last five years. You know, anything that goes on, goes against narrative in, um, you know, on that side of the, of the aisle now in, in media terms, it, it, instantly evokes accusations of being, um, you know, right wing or, I, you know, an enabler of the right wing. I mean, right now there's a headline about me and Glenn Greenwald in current affairs where Nathan Robinson, um, who, if you held a knife to a child's throat and demanded it, couldn't write an article uh, shorter than 8,500 words. But, uh, you know, he's got this gigantic screed accusing Glenn and me of being tools of the right, even though, the, you know, there aren't any actual examples of, you know, us taking right wing positions on anything. Uh, but the the implication of these of these comments is that by being um, by taking a position that is not ours, you are aligning yourself with the evil forces of the right uh, and therefore you're to be attacked, you're to be shunned, you're to be kicked out of the, out of the club. And, um, you know, and that's a dangerous, again, what, what's so insidious about that is that, uh, you know, the end game of that kind of rhetoric is, to, is, is often getting people fired or, or, you know, getting them separated from their sources of income, um, you know, or worse, right? Or getting them removed from the internet in some cases. Uh, you know, these days to be accused of of that is essentially to be accused of hate speech, conspiracy theory, uh, you know, incitement, insurrectionism, uh, and it's uh, it's it's an incredibly disingenuous and. Um, 
and I think you know just irresponsible way of dealing with criticism. If if you're being criticized, argue the issues with people. Uh, don't don't come back with with that kind of a tactic. You know, it's been very frustrating for me, um, both on the Russia story, but particularly on the censorship story, where what I've been trying to say for years now is um, censorship is not uh, a solution that should be embraced by people on, on the left or people who are traditionally liberal, even if you think in the short term it, it's going to um, help combat, for instance, the Trump movement, eventually it will back up on all of us. And it's not a traditionally like liberal position, you know? And, and But for that, for, for saying that, I've been constantly denounced as as a right winger, right? Because there's this whole idea that, that free speech is a stalking horse for the right now. And um, again, it's, it's a dishonest, dishonest tactic. It's not, it's designed to kind of end conversation and debate um, and get people to respond emotionally. And um, I think when I saw that Jenk had done that, that was something that I, I very seriously disagreed with. And just out of the context of the media for a minute, um, I don't know if you saw the recent uh, guidelines or the, the requests from Joe Biden that uh, people report uh, radical members of their family or co-workers or friends. And uh, also the, the guidance that was put out where they're essentially listing any reason that you may oppose the government <laughs> makes you essentially a domestic terrorist. So do you think that, you know, we're really moving in a bad direction soon where where free speech is going to be uh, potentially punished by the government? This whole thing with the d domestic terrorism movement, um, it's its its astonishing to me that there are people who lived through the first war on terror who don't know where this is headed. Uh, they've, they've essentially taken the same campaign that Dick Cheney and people like Donald Rumsfeld launched in 2001, uh, you know, which was a gigantic power ask, right? The, what the, the argument was, we're under threat, um, the tools that we have to fight that threat are insufficient. So we need we need a vast new authority to listen to what everybody is saying, uh, to secretly punish people, uh, to eliminate due process for certain kinds of offenders because that, that will just slow us down. And what ended up happening was we spent 20 years building this essentially unaccountable state within a state of vast surveillance state that we, we can't do anything about. Uh, it's, it's essentially beyond the law at this point. And now they've rebranded that. That that first campaign was aimed more at, at Republicans than it was at Democrats. They've rebranded it for sort of blue state audiences. And they're saying, yeah, we, we need vast new powers to prevent January 6th from happening again. And um, we want you to to cooperate with the authorities and building this new gigantic new machinery that will keep everybody safe. Um, but you know we know how this ends. I mean, it, it it's it's going to end in in a in a domestic surveillance state that um, is just inescapable. And it's it's astonishing to me that people who who were raised um, as liberal thinkers. Uh, and as people who value civil rights and understand um, ostensibly, you know, what happens in authoritarian governments, that they don't recognize where this is going. I mean, it's just as clear as day, uh, you know, what this kind of behavior is going to lead to. And yet you, you see people who, you know, 15 years ago would have been shaking their fist at Don Dick Cheney and, and Bush. And they're cheering this on because they think they suddenly think the security services are on their side. It's it's just nuts to me. So something that's a little difficult to talk about on the left um, with any kind of nuance is how the government has reacted to COVID and also the uh, January 6th uh, riot at the Capitol. And I think that you know, a lot of folks on the left really don't feel comfortable questioning either of those things for sounding as though they're a right wing conspiracy theorist. Um, but, you know, I, I think there can be an extreme to that where I came across somebody on Twitter where in their bio, it said Ashley Babbitt got what she deserved. So um, I don't know. Can you just maybe speak to, um, you know, maybe some of the potentially <laughs> dystopian 
reactions that we might be seeing in regards to both COVID and the January 6th riot? So the, the there's a, a trend that we've seen uh, in media and in culture generally where rather than think through each individual issue or each individual subject, um, what people have done is they've worked backwards. Like whatever Donald Trump said, we're on the other side of that. Uh, so with COVID, this it resulted in all, all sorts of bizarre uh, situations where, you know, Donald Trump says he's taking hydroxychloroquine. So, you know, ipso facto, you know, the three dots, therefore, right? Th therefore, hydroxychloroquine is a conspiracy theory. Well, in fact, hydroxychloroquine is just a drug. It doesn't it doesn't have political content. It, it maybe didn't work, uh, but it was something that had to be investigated on its own merits, irrespective of Donald Trump. I mean, Trump had nothing to do with it. Uh, and th this has been um, kind of the instinct that we've seen over and over and over again with this issue. Whatever he said about masks, we were on the other side about, uh, of that. Uh, whatever whatever people believe, believed about lockdowns or the use of ventilators or shutting down the, the borders or whatever it was, people just took the opposite side and that was how they, they, they thought things through. Um, and again, it's 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 not a smart way of, of dealing with things. You know, from a reporter's perspective, you just can't do that. You got to wipe the slate clean with each story, and evaluate everything on its own terms. Uh, and and we haven't done that with with the insurrection. I hate even using that word because there's a propaganda reason they use that. But um, it was a coup, Matt. Yeah, it was a right. It was a coup. I mean, look, they. There were, as we've seen with the Russia story, there were sort of myriad mistakes in over-reporting of that, you know, from the Brian Sicknick thing, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, you know, there, there's a there's a tendency to, um, to sort of just go along with this narrative that it was the, you know, something more horrible than 9-11 uh, and, and not to examine well, who might benefit from, you know, from believing that, right? Like, you know, again, what's the end game here? And if the end game is we're going to have a domestic terrorism bill where we're we're, we're going to have FISA now directed at American citizens or something like that, um, you know, you have to worry about that. You have to think about that. But people don't think about that because it's because it's unacceptable to be even seen questioning these things because people are afraid of the thing you were talking about at the beginning of the show where you're accused of being right wing for bringing up any of these questions. I mean, it's it's like a vicious cycle, you know, um, the the fear of being cast in with the evil Trumpists um, has led to this intellectual paralysis about issues that have nothing to do with Trump. And um, I think that's a dangerous place for not just the left, but for any, anyone to be. Well, I seriously think it is Orwellian in some degree, insofar as uh, there there is doublethink and there is a, a real uh, amnesia that occurs too, right? So, I mean, George W. Bush, 10, 15 years ago, was the devil. You know, the Democrats hated him. Now he's widely loved and respected by, by mainstream right. liberals. Uh, 2012 election. Uh, Barack Obama laughed at Mitt Romney, and many Democrats laughed at Mitt Romney for saying that Russia is our number one geopolitical foe. Now, you know, I think that they'd say they owe Mitt Romney an apology for that. And even in, in this past year, um, the lab leak theory, when that originally emerged, that was seen as this crazy Trump right wing kind of uh, kind of idea. And now, you know, John Oliver, or excuse me, uh, John Stewart is going on Stephen Colbert's show and, and kind of pushing that. And we're seeing more of an embrace of that idea from the media. So can you just speak to that at all? Like, how how does that sort of amnesia, how, how are people able to reconcile that in their heads? Yeah, it's, it's amazing. I mean, the people are, have, have gotten so in the habit of living in the moment that, that um, the idea of kind of sticking with a principle or, or is, is just alien to people. The, the, you know, public opinion changes so rapidly now and people have committed themselves to just change with it, no matter what that what their prior opinions might have been. You, know, you mentioned the, the Mitt Romney thing. You can go back and find Rachel Maddow saying, cheering Obama on for, for, 
for ripping Mitt Romney and, and saying, you know, Russia is the uh, just a gnat on the butt of an elephant, is uh, according to Barack Obama. This is this is Rachel Maddow saying that, uh, and then just a couple of years later, she's saying Russia is this overarching, um, you know, fiendish presence that you know is threatening the American way of life and can turn off our energy grids if if they wanted. Uh, and there's there's no recognition that there's any discrepancy there. Now, the the reality is somewhere in between. Like Russia is certainly not our friend, but I think it's it's just logical to recognize that, you know, economically they're not anywhere near as big a threat to the United States, say theoretically, as China is. They have an economy that's like the size of South Korea or Italy. Um, you know that they, they are, relatively speaking, not a major uh, in threat to the United States globally, they have a powerful military, but and they have a lot of territory, but that's really about it. Uh, and we're unable to say that because the current fashion is is to recognize otherwise. And so people are drifting in and out of these these fashion like takes. Um, you know, I saw I saw some, an article in the New York Post of all places that talked about. Um, sort of luxury beliefs or I think it was like luxury opinions and this is this is what we've I think we're in this place now where where things just sort of come into fashion beliefs just sort of come into fashion among upper class educated uh, people and they don't think about what what the meaning of those things are it's it's more a branding exercise uh, just to show solidarity with other people of their of their class and that's what's so creepy about it so my next question is probably a bit off topic, but I'd really uh, like your opinion on it because uh, you've been in the media for a while and know a bit about independent media. So one story that I covered pretty in depth last year was um, the story of the Green Party 2020 nomination process. And it was interesting for a few different reasons. One was that during an interview that I conducted with Howie Hawkins, he seemingly embraced the Russiagate talking points which is very odd for a Green Party frontrunner considering what had just happened to Jill Stein and how she was demonized as being a Russian asset. Um, so there was that. There was also calls from basically every other Green Party candidate saying that the nomination was being rigged. So you had people who were in the Green Party steering committee also working in the Howie Hawkins campaign. You had uh, just social media accounts attacking other Green Party candidates. You had uh, phantom primaries taking place and primaries where Howie Hawkins was the only candidate uh, on the ballot. And then additionally, there was another story that emerged sort of last minute where Jesse Ventura had expressed an interest in uh, running for the party's nomination and he was seemingly kind of gaslit out of that. Uh, he also had some personal issues why he um, was ambivalent about running. So um, Yeah, I, talk, I, I talked really to him at that time. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah. I didn't see much coverage uh, from that, you know, about that story. Uh, again, uh, I covered it a bit. Richard Medhurst covered it a little bit. Uh, Nico House did. George Galloway brought up some of the issues about what Howie Hawkins had said, the controversial things about Russiagate, about Bashar al-Assad, about Julian Assange. He, uh, George Galloway brought that up in an interview. But generally speaking, I didn't see much coverage uh, from independent media. And I'm just wondering uh, what your thoughts are, why folks may have either... Uh, not really cared about the Green Party nomination or just didn't want to report on it? Obviously, there's a difference of opinion. Um, there are some people who probably um, in the Green... I, I was a Green once, by the way. I was a registered Green uh, for, for years. I actually ran a Congressional Green Party. Uh, uh, I was the manager for a, uh, an unsuccessful Green Party congressional candidate once uh, in Buffalo. Um, but look, there... After 2016, there was so much criticism directed towards the Jill Stein candidacy that there was, from what I understand, there was a schism within the Green Party, which where some people were sort of in favor of, well, let's be the Green Party, but only, um, but sort of like the loyal opposition to, to the de Democrats, right? We're, we're going to um, be different from them in certain ways uh, as a brand, uh, but we're not going to be, uh, you know, wholly in opposition. We're not going to do anything that, that threatens their ability to beat Donald Trump, 
And, you know, I think there were some people who honestly had regrets about that in 2016, whether that was justified or not. Um, and then there were other people who, who, you know, genuinely wanted to advocate for what the Green Party ostensibly believes in, didn't have any interest in cooperating either with public opinion, or, you know, the sort of establishment opinion or the Democrats or whatever. Um, and, you know, so I think the former people are, you know, did what you described. They, they started taking positions against Assange or on Syria or on Russia or whatever it was, yeah, sort of as a signaling mechanism that they're, you know, they're not, they're not going to be the, the pain in the ass that they were previously. Um, and, uh, you know, and we ended up not getting a Green Party candidate that attracted a, a significant amount of support away from, from the Democrats. So you can draw whatever conclusions you want away from that. But it's, it seems to me that, you know, it's just, it's, it's the same story you were talking about with, with the Young Turks or any other uh, independent media outlet, you know, eventually you, you, you reach a, um, a stage in your development where you have to choose between becoming um, sort of part of the the institutional picture uh, or continuing to be in opposition. And, you know, for some people, they end up making a different de decision about that down the line. So one common theme that I did recognize uh, between TYT and Howie Hawkins and also uh, the Gravel teams, the, the teams who were running uh, Mike Gravel's campaign last year, is they all had sort of these uh, establishment like takes on Syria, or at least uh, anti-Assad takes, I guess I should, I should say. Um, and I think that one thing that really gives them cover for that is that Noam Chomsky also has said, you know, when I was interviewing him, he, he said to me, he thought that U.S. forces could serve a positive role in Syria to help protect the Kurds. As far as the U.S. being involved in the civil war, we, we should, should we be or should we not be involved in, in the civil war in Syria? Well, depends what you mean by involved. So should we have been giving arms to the opposition? Uh, I, it's very hard to say. Remember that the Assad regime is a brutal, murderous regime. It happens to be the legal government, but it's responsible for most of the atrocities. Now, at the very beginning, you go back to the beginning, there were peaceful protests, nonviolent protests calling for mild reforms, uh, democratizing the uh, very harsh authoritarian system, some economic reforms. They were met with vicious repression. Uh, that set off the civil war. Uh, there were uh, forces in Syria, kind of moderate democratic reformist forces, uh, which were trying to maintain themselves, but pretty quickly were overwhelmed by the jihadi elements that, are the, that were started pouring in. And that led to a very complex civil war with many sides. Should the U.S. have been involved at that point? Well, if there had been, not the U.S., but if there had been any way to protect the uh, democratic, actual democratic forces, probably would have been worth doing, but there may not have been such a way. It just seems, I guess, a little counterintuitive, you know, because you've been so outspoken against um, the U.S. acting as a, as a global police force, especially in concert with NATO. I'm not opposed to the police either. If uh, my house gets robbed, I call the police. Okay. I'm against the police when they shoot people. Uh, but the uh, social and political world is not an axiom system where there are simple rules that you just follow rigorously. It doesn't make any sense. Life's much too complicated for that. You have to ask about the consequences of the policies you're talking about. So take, say, uh, a contingent of U.S. troops in uh, Rojava, the Kurdish areas. I don't want to see U.S. forces abroad. I also don't want to see Kurds massacred, okay? You have to make a choice sometimes. That's one of the issues where I personally kind of disagree with Noam Chomsky. There are some others. He uh, also told me you know, he's in favor of gun control, which is kind of just, I think, an odd thing for an anarchist to say. And uh, he also is, is really skeptical of a lot of different conspiracy theories, including the John F. Kennedy assassination uh, conspiracy theory. 
So I guess uh, just my my general question is about Noam Chomsky because I know that uh, you know you've you've met with him before uh, when when he was on my show again he he said actually you and Glenn Greenwald are two of the journalists that he respects the most um, but just in regards to some of these issues that I laid out here do you think that Noam Chomsky has changed at all over recent years just generally in some of his opinions and do you think that maybe some Chom some of Chomsky's bad takes may hurt the anti-imperialist left in some ways. Well, first of all, Noam Chomsky is not the Pope. I mean, and I and I think it's unfair that that people appeal to him to try to settle disputes and and you know what's what's your pronouncement on this or that topic. I mean, he's a human being. He has he has his own um, opinions on things. He's he's been around for for quite a long time. He's produced this incredible amount of work, um, you know. And and uh, obviously. You can't agree with a person about everything, uh, and it would be unnatural if if we did. Um, you know, I I disagree with him about certain things. I think it's okay to disagree with him about things, and still have enormous respect for uh, his work. And I don't, you know, I wouldn't even know if I characterize his recent takes as bad takes. It's just that sometimes he has a different point of view of things on the Syria question. You know, I. I that's that's a, that's an area where I've tried not to say a whole lot because I don't know. You know, I haven't been there. I ha um, I haven't spent a whole lot of time covering that issue, and um, I try not to talk about uh, subjects that I don't know a whole lot about. Uh, Chomsky's sort of different. He reads so voraciously uh, that he opines on everything, um, and you know, it's I think it's possible sometimes that. You you can you can speak about a thing and and not necessarily, um, you know, be right about it just because you you might have been misled by something that you read, um, or or maybe he's right about it and we we just don't know. I mean, I, I on on the on the Syria issue, my my instinct um, is that you know there's been a propaganda campaign about it as there is with almost every one of our interventionist uh, adventures. Uh, that campaign has downplayed certain um, certain elements of the story, like the fact that the people we're aligned with are, uh, you know, essentially Al Qaeda, right? Like there, there's, um, you know, there's there are real questions in terms of the people, the forces that we've been backing in that story, uh, but because that's the same position that say somebody like Michael Flynn took. Um, you know, that's there, it's become infamous, so people are 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 not talking about it. Um, you know, the the this the Syria thing, it's been used as such a, a a shortcut to smear people in the last five years. I mean, I think Tulsi Gabbard got it probably worse than anybody. Um, that term Assadist has has suddenly become, uh, you know, a term of art. And again, it's it's the the same people who 15 years ago would have would have completely blanched at calling somebody a Saddam lover uh, and now now they're just running with terms like a sadist it's they're just not recognizing the the um, the contradiction there so I don't know I'm sorry it's a long-winded answer I have huge respect for Noam Chomsky I, if I ever if I even make it to his age and I'm still able to, to speak a coherent sentence I, I will consider myself Hugely lucky. I think he's, um, you know, a giant intellectually, and uh, you know, it, 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 I sometimes feel like, um, you know, he's been forced into a role that that isn't fair to him. So Matt, I know we've gone a a full hour. I don't know if you have just a few more minutes for you. I did have some questions for my patrons for you. Sure. Aggressive leftist asks. Hey, Matt, I'm a huge fan of your work. I have noticed a lot of security state propaganda like Russiagate or regime change in Libya and Syria is targeted towards the left. With things like this and the recent woke CIA ad, why do you think this type of propaganda is now being directed more towards the left? Well, I think that's obvious. The, 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 I think a lot of people who are in the national security world recognize that their, their, their most potent opposition um, has come from the other side. And let's not forget that they were in a little bit of trouble uh, in 2014 and 2015 after Snowden um, 
you know, came out with his revelations. There was an enormous amount of coverage of, um, you know, John Brennan and James Clapper lying to Congress. There were calls for their re resignations. There was a lot of neg negative coverage of the drone assassination campaign. Um, and, you know, they were on they were on the wrong side of, of a, a, a pretty serious uh, sort of movement that was led almost entirely, you know, on, on the left. Um, and they flipped the script. You know, they've, they've managed to, to make people like Julian Assange into uh, a villain. Uh, they have used, used the, the Trump years to rehabilitate their image by presenting themselves as uh, sort of allies of the resistance. And um, they've cured a lot of their public relations problems. And this shouldn't be surprising because these people are public relations experts. That's what they do. They, they, they lie for a living um, and they're good at it, you know? <laughs> I mean, so uh, we shouldn't be surprised that they've that they've turned around and tried to ingratiate themselves with their harshest critics because that's the obvious move. It's taken a while for them to get there, but they didn't they didn't have to do it before because the left was never a threat to anybody until recently. So um, they were they could safely ignore them once upon a time. Now they can't. So they're going after them. Nick wanted to know if you ever met Hunter S. Thompson. No, I spoke to him on the phone once. Um, it's actually kind of a funny story. Uh, I had been commissioned by a publisher a long time ago when I was pretty young uh, to do a, um, to edit a, uh, an anthology of gonzo journalism. And I started to put together the anthology and the more I did it, uh, the more I started to realize that gonzo journalism was essentially a meaningless term. Like it, it just meant Hunter Thompson. Right. So so if you were putting together an anthology of gonzo journalism, it would be Hunter and a whole bunch of people trying to be Hunter. Right. <laughs> uh, so it would be sort of a stupid project, but I needed the money. So um, I called up Hunter and I in my head, I decided I would I would continue with the project if he gave it his blessing and I would abandon it if he didn't. So um, I got him on the phone and uh, he said, uh, well, what is it? And I explained it to him and he goes, he goes, sounds like a piece of shit project. He said. <laughs> and uh, I said, yeah, it kind of is. And he goes, well, how badly do you need the money? And I, <laughs> and I said, I, I need it pretty badly. He's like, well, you know, he's like, I'll leave it up to you, but it sucks. And, um, and he didn't want any part of it, didn't want to participate. So that was the end of that. Um, otherwise I never met him. No. Alex Edwards in uh, Oregon says, do you view the division of the media on the independent left, Aaron Maté versus TYT, another example uh, of this, uh, is forced to vote versus the, the versus the detractors of that, to have similar aspects to the work that you've done on Hate Inc. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, I hadn't thought about that, but sure. I mean, it, it's, got, it's got some of the same characteristics because financially the incentives are there for both sides even there right i mean it's not the same kind of money but um look what ends up happening in media is you get an audience and i talked about this before if you go against what your audience's expectations are you lose audience you lose money right so um what people end up you know not doing that they end up not challenging their audience and in this schism uh, on, I guess you would call it the left, you're going to get camps and their, their, their business is going to depend on them, um, you know, continuing to agitate in one direction and the other camp is going to, their, their livelihood depends on them agitating in the other direction. And that's probably why you're, you're going to continue to see those divisions, um, you know, un, unless they can come to some sort of rapprochement, but the, with the way things work, is you get more hits for being more aggressive. So that's why um, these things tend not to resolve. And that's why they haven't resolved in the larger one, the larger blue red uh, division, you know, has only gotten more heated over the years because that's the way the dynamic works. You, you, you get paid more the, the, the more hardcore you are. So, you know, that's how, that's how it works.
So final question, Jesse from Idaho submitted two, so you can pick one if you'd like. Uh, he said, first one, what is your opinion on uh, Ukraine seeking to join NATO? And the second one, he said, any predictions on the New York City mayoral primaries? I think I'll pick the NATO one. Um, okay. So having lived in Russia, uh, the NATO question, I think Americans don't understand um, how how intensely the Russian people view that issue. Um, in 1990, 1990 or 1991, um, we had meetings with uh, then-Soviet leaders where we ne were negotiating things like the, the you know bringing down the wall in Berlin. And the Russians have always contended, and there are actually transcripts of some of these meetings that, that back this up, um, that we promised uh, them that in exchange for, for them bringing down the wall and you know ending Soviet rule, that NATO would not set foot in their direction, that they, they wouldn't go, pia go, go past uh, West Germany. And so they see our steady march in that direction as this enormous betrayal and a, and a threat, right? Um, it, Americans just have such a hard time imagining what this feels like because we've always been in this this posture of complete safety where we don't have any enemies on our border. But if you can ima imagine this, that the situation is reversed and a longtime enemy of ours um, has has agreed never to come closer, uh, you know, than West Africa to the United States, and is suddenly, you know, adding allies all the way up South America and up up the isthmus to to Mexico. Um, people would be really, really freaked out, you know. And I think, you know, adding Ukraine to NATO, um, you know, an organization that was created to oppose a country that no longer exists. Uh, you know, I'm not sure that the benefits there outweigh um, the negatives, which are it, it, it guarantees a certain level of hostility from the Russians who are a nuclear power uh, and whose cooperation we would probably want um, down the road. So uh, I don't think that's a smart move. Um, I understand it from the Ukrainians pr perspective to a degree, uh, but uh, you know, as as we've seen, a lot of those countries that that um, end up throwing their hat in, their hat in the ring with us end up kind of regretting it later, um, including Russia, by the way. You know, like Russia was one of those countries that tried to sign on with the with the kind of neoliberal team, and um, what ended up happening was they we we ended up getting a nationalist movement that was um, you know in response to that 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 was not necessarily positive for the Russian people. So uh, not not a fan of that whole situation. Well, Matt, I really do appreciate you being back on the show and going through all of these different topics. For folks out there who would like to follow you and stay up to date with your latest work, how can they do that? Uh, they can go to uh, taibi at substack.com or usefulidiots at, at substack.com. And uh, yeah, please check it out. And uh, thanks so much for having me back and welcome back. I like the new, the, the new look in the show and, and uh, you know, looking forward to talking again in the future. Thank you. I appreciate it a lot. And uh, yeah, I'd love to have you back on sometime soon. All right. Take care.